your adrenaline is bringing blood to the skin's surface. It's causing your pores to open and you're sweating. This is your body responding to its natural desire to run from a dangerous situation. Your heart rate is increasing to the point where it feels like it's going to explode. Your heart's providing as much blood as possible to help you run. Your body's become cold and you feel frozen to the spot. Why? Because your body's reminding you that playing dead is sometimes the best option. Did you hear that noise? Maybe it was just my imagination. Welcome to Extraordinary Stories Podcast. How are you? Are you well? Are you good? I am. Okay, so here we are again, the second episode of Extraordinary Stories Podcast Short Stories. If you didn't hear last week's, go back and listen. Christian the Lion. What are these episodes? Well, I'll explain it again. I'll I'll stop explaining it each episode because I know you probably know, but if you don't, these are uh, a midweek episode in which I tell a shorter story, a smaller story than than the main one that comes out at the weekend. Okay, I'm just going to do some quick shout outs and then we'll get on with the story. I've got some new shout out music, indeed, courtesy of Claire O'Meara. Honestly, the things that you guys send me are just amazing. So Claire sent me some music for the podcast. Um, Everything up to date has been my own stuff. So she sent me something through and asked me if I wanted to use it. It's quite dramatic for the shout outs, but I decided I quite like that. It feels like it's, it feels like it gives the shout outs a sense of drama. So it's a hello to Kathleen Kalaizidis. And I pray to God I said that correctly because I've been practicing how to say that surname. It's quite a tricky one. So hello, Kathleen. Hello, Anne Shelsey, Lizzie Tree, Clive Catterall, Jimmy Evans, Kate Kennerson, and hello to Sophie Jackson and her husband, Justin Bartholomew, who were on holiday recently and were listening to the podcast and discussing it. So thank you for getting in touch. If you want a shout out, just ask me. Just, you know, get to me through the Facebook group. Just contact me. I'm happy to give shout outs. This one I'm just going to give because it really made me laugh. We'll call, um, there's no name for this one, so we'll call her Mrs. X. So Mrs. X got in touch via email to tell me, just in a sort of funny, funny anecdotal way, that she and her husband were, they got in the car, they were going on a drive, they got in and she put the podcast on and her husband said, oh, for God's sake, you're not listening to this Scottish guy again, are you? And she said, yeah. And he said, well, why do you like it so much? And she said, oh, I just think he's got a really sexy voice. At which point her husband stopped speaking to her. <laughs> he didn't speak to her for two hours. Now, I think that's slightly hilarious because the last thing I would describe my voice as is sexy. I think if you asked anyone in my circle of friends or family if my voice was sexy, they'd say, uh, no. Um, so that just really made me laugh. So I'm going to do a shout out, not to Mrs X, but to Mr X 
and I'm going to try and do it in what I think is going to be rubbish, but what I think is my sexiest voice. So here I go. <clears throat> Mr. X. <laughs> it already sounds terrible. Mr. X, please don't be annoyed with your wife for liking my voice. I hope that one day you two can listen to the podcast and enjoy my dulcet tones. <laughs> that was awful. That's probably just creep, creeped him out more than actually uh, enticed him to listen. Okay, so very quickly, just before we get to it, other podcast shout outs. If you haven't heard last week's Generation Y called Abraham Shakespeare, go and listen. It is wonderful. It's such an amazing story and it's obviously Generation Y. It's so well told. Those guys do an amazing job. It's one of those ones where, and I never get this, I can swear, honestly, I never get this, but about halfway through that episode, I started to think, shit, I wish I had found this bloody story for <laughs> Extraordinary Stories. I really wish I'd found it because it's got so many twists and turns. It's really brilliant. Also, Moms and Murder, I'm really enjoying at the moment, and Small Town Murder, all doing brilliant work in the podcasting field. Okay, so enough of the chat. Let's get on with it. Are you ready for the story of Theodore Edward Coney's? Okay, let's go. So Theodore Edward Coney's was born in Illinois, in 1882. As a child, he suffered from really ill health. He had one health issue after another. Breathing issues, growth issues, just so many, so many things. He'd been given a kind of fragile body and he would suffer long periods of illness. Now that meant that he missed quite a lot of school and as a result, he was fairly uneducated. His literacy skills were poor. And as a teenager, doctors told Theodore that it was unlikely he would make it beyond the age of 18. However, he defied doctors and he grew up to be an adult. So as an adult, he moved to Denver and he went around from job to job. Nothing ever too permanent, nothing ever too substantial or too great. More just kind of menial job here, there, everywhere. It's said that Theodore hated the way that people spoke to him. He said that people would talk down to him because he was uneducated and because his body was frail and this caused him a great deal of frustration. So these jobs that he were doing, well, they weren't offering him a great deal in the way of money and... Unfortunately, Theodore would have really sustained periods of homelessness. So after one particularly long period of homelessness, he was absolutely desperate. He wanted out of the life that he was living, and so he came up with a plan. He would visit an old friend of his named Peter Phillips and ask for a loan. They'd known each other since childhood, but they hadn't seen each other in years. So the plan was to go and to ask Peter Phillips to loan him some money. So off he goes to the Peter's house and he knocks on the door. But he gets no answer. He waits outside of the property for a while. Now the property is a fairly modest three-bedroom house with a small backyard. It's quite a nice looking little house. So time passes and there's there's no sign of life inside the house. He's still waiting outside and no one's come to the house and no one's left. So he gets an idea. He thinks, I'll, I'll see if the house is unlocked and if it is, I'll wait inside. I mean, it's an idea, but side note, how freaked would you be if you came home and someone you hadn't really known for a long time was sitting in your living room? I mean, even just someone, anyone you'd 
sitting in your living room when you're not expecting them is a bit of a shock. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so for Theodore, luckily, the house is unlocked. He goes in, he looks around, he thinks, nice house. He's going into rooms, he's looking in cupboards, and in one of the upstairs bedroom cupboards, he finds a small little door. And when he tries it, just out of curiosity, he discovers that it leads to the attic of the house. So now another plan begins to form in Theodore's mind. Why ask his old friend for money when he could actually just stay in his friend's attic. So in he goes. Theodore has almost nothing in the way of possessions. Remember I said he was homeless, he just didn't really have an awful lot of stuff. He had a small bag that he carried over his shoulder, he had some tobacco and a pistol that he had acquired when he lived on the streets. So that evening, the Philip family return. So the Philip family is made up of Peter Phillips, his wife and their young son. They return home. They have no idea he's in the attic. Of course not. Why why would they? So they go about their lives as normal. Over the course of the next four weeks, it would go like this. Theodore would wait until he was absolutely sure the entire family were out of the house He would come out of the attic, go downstairs, use the bathroom, eat the family's food and return to his hiding place. The family, during this period, on two separate occasions, they heard a noise from somewhere in the house which to them felt unfamiliar. You know when you're in your own house and you've been living there for a while and you start to get used to what your own house noises are? But they were hearing these noises and thinking, hmm... That doesn't sound quite right. But they just they just brushed it off as a house noise that they hadn't heard before. The first time it happened, they were all eating dinner. And they questioned it, but they didn't do anything about it. The second time Mrs Phillips was home alone, it was in the afternoon, she was in her bedroom and she heard the noise again. She said it was something like a bang but not quite. Now, being alone in the house, she became a little bit scared. She went downstairs, out of the house, and to a neighbour's until her husband came home from work. When Mr Phillips arrived home, his wife returned. She reported to him the noise, and he assured her it was just her imagination. It was nothing to fear. So it's been a month. And now Theodore has gotten away with this, but he's about to make a major mistake. The Phillips family are out for the day, all three of them. And so hearing silence downstairs, Theodore lets himself out of the attic and begins to go downstairs. Here's the mistake. Not everyone was out of the house. Peter Phillips was standing in his living room when Theodore walked in. The two men looked at each other in complete shock. Ten seconds later, Peter Phillips would be dead. Theodore took out the pistol I mentioned earlier and shot Peter Phillips dead in his own living room. He then took a fire iron and beat Peter's face until it was unrecognisable. After this, what did Theodore do? Did he run? Did he flee the scene? Did he get as far away as possible? No. He returned to the attic. So hours later, a neighbour comes over to the house to return an item that had been borrowed weeks before. And he discovers 
Peter Phillips' dead body lying in the living room. Police are called and Mrs Phillips and her son, they're informed of the death and the investigation begins. Police are left very confused. There is no sign of the gun. There is no sighting of anyone arriving at or leaving the house. There's no signs of forced entry. And also, what was the motive here? Why would anyone want this man dead? Mrs Phillips, absolutely devastated by her husband's death, tries to carry on. And so what she does is she hires a housekeeper. But a few weeks into the job, the housekeeper quits. Why? Well, she says, things keep going missing in the house. Things appear to move on their own. But most of all, she keeps hearing strange noises. And it's beginning to really scare her. Now, the housekeeper, being a superstitious woman, she believed it was a ghost. Not too long after this, Mrs Phillips actually, she started to believe the same thing. She too was freaked out by the weird things going missing, things moving, and the noises. So she took her son and they moved out. They moved to the next town over. So where does this leave Theodore? Well, he's now got the house to himself. But... This is where he's about to make his next major mistake. He starts going round the house putting on lights, putting on the TV. And people start to notice, hang on, there was no one living in that house. Why are there now lights on inside of it? And it becomes known as the haunted house in the neighbourhood. You know the ones, like, I remember them from when I was young, like, there's always that one house that's like, ooh, that house is creepy, and ooh, lots of things have happened in it. So, the Phillips house becomes that house. Police get reports of this, and they put surveillance on the house, because they still can't solve this murder, they still don't know what happened, so they think, okay, let's put some surveillance on this. And now Theodore is going to make his next and Well, final major mistake. He starts appearing at the windows of the house and looking out, completely unaware that he's being watched. So police go in and they find him in the attic. They arrest him firstly for trespassing, but then later for the murder of Peter Phillips. Theodore went to prison for life and he died in 1967. And so ends the story of Theodore Edward Coney's. Hi, I'm Tawny Plattis, one of the creators of the Dirty Bits podcast on the Orbital Jigsaw Network. I'm a voiceover actor who very casually, and sometimes comically, retells the sexy, scandalous, and salacious stories from history your teacher probably left out. Listen to a new episode every Tuesday, and find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter by visiting orbitaljigsaw.com. Okay, so go check your attics. (laughs) Go check your lofts. Um, Go just check if there's a madman hiding in your house because you never bloody know. There might be. You got a madman living in your attic. I'll tell you how I got here to this story, which is just, I just think it's so bizarre. I just think the idea of someone living in your bloody attic for that length of time is so strange. But you can almost, you can almost see the other side of it where you go, there's a bit of it that you go, how could you not know? But it's easy to not know. Do you know what I mean? If you... If you're out and you're working and you're busy and you've got a family, you might not notice that some milk's gone missing for your fridge or, you know, some cheese has disappeared or there's a a few 
slices of bread gone missing, you don't really pay attention to these things necessarily daily. Yeah, of course, if things are moving, if you've come in and a chair was on one side of the room when you left for work and it's on the other when you came back, yeah, you might get suspicious. But actually, when it's just like doing small things, I think you could get away with it for a, for a while. But anyway, how I got to here, how I got to this story, was that someone asked me if I would cover the auto and the attic story. I don't know if you know that one. Now, it's been covered by lots of podcasts. It's quite similar to the one I've just told you, but it's a much, much longer story. It's a much bigger one. And while I love it, while I think it's a brilliant story, lots of other podcasts have covered it. So if you want to find it, look up Otto and the Attic. You'll find it. So I decided, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't look at that. So I was going to look at something else. And then this is really weird. Someone else sent me the story of a Japanese man who in 2008 discovered that a homeless woman had been living in his spare room wardrobe for a year. And how he caught her was he put hidden cameras in the house because he started to notice things were going missing from his fridge. He lived alone and he was like, I know how much I left of that particular pint of milk. Why, when I come home, is there less than than when I left it? And it turns out, yeah, this homeless woman had been living in his wardrobe for almost a year. So between the combination of not wanting to do the auto story, but kind of loving the Japanese one, I found the story of Theodore. Okay. So, well, that's the end of that. That's the end of the short stories. Okay. Keep the stories coming to me, please. These are what fuel these short episodes. Okay. Even if I don't tell the story that you send me, it'll give me a direction to go in. It'll give me something to think about. Okay. I'll speak to you at the weekend with the main episode. But in the meantime, should you want to get in touch, you can get me on all social medias. Go join the Facebook group. I'm there, Extraordinary Stories Podcast, Twitter, Instagram. If you want to help the podcast grow, you can help me on Patreon. Any donation is welcome. Okay, goodbye. It didn't, it didn't affect me really one way or the other. <laughs> I would imagine from the look on his face, let's get it on, let's do it, let's get it over. Let's get it on. Let's do it. Let's get it over. <laughs>